Discussing the fall of a state is one of the most popular topics in academic circles pertaining to the subject of history. Many historians have battled the age-old question of, what causes a state to fall? Do specific historical events cause a state to fall, or do long-lasting economic, military, or social decline cause a state to decline? Or a combination of both? We know that some states fracture from within, while others are conquered by other states. It is often tricky to point out when a state starts its decline. Whatever the reasoning is, a fall of a state always leaves a trail of chaos and destruction in the regions it once ruled. So, when did the Ottomans begin their decline? Did it begin with Suleiman the Magnificent's fateful decision to execute his capable son and heir Mustafa? Was it the ascension of Selim the Drunk to the Ottoman throne? Or the defeat at the Battle of Pento that saw a generation of Ottoman admirals perish? Was it the Kafa system established during the reign of Ahmed I, or perhaps the general crisis of the 17th century? Was it the Sultan of Women, which saw the empire being ruled effectively by the wives of the Ottoman sultans? Maybe it started with the Ottoman failure to capture Vienna in 1683, or the Treaty of Karlowitz that ended the Great Turkish War. It could have been the Treaty of Kuchukainanjar signed with Russia during the aftermath of the Sixth Russo-Turkish War? Could it have been Napoleon's invasion of Egypt or Muhammad Ali's wars against the Sublime Port? Or was it the Crimean War that devastated the Ottoman treasury to a point that it was now dependent on foreign loans? Instead of asking when did it all go wrong, we should instead ask how did the Ottomans survive for so long after so many disasters? The Ottoman Empire was one of the largest empires in human history. At its territorial height during the 17th century, the empire spanned from the gates of Vienna and Austria to the warm trading ports of Yemen, from the steep Zagros mountains of Persia to the pearly beaches of Algeria. Having one of the largest and most effective militaries in the world, the Ottomans would dominate European and Middle Eastern politics for over four centuries. However, after a series of military defeats in the late 18th century and the rise of nationalism on the European continent, the Ottomans would slowly lose hold over their imperial provinces over the course of 150 years. The first Ottoman leader to realize this change in the wind was Sultan Selim III the 28th Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Coming to power during the beginning of the French Revolution, Selim III, unlike his recent predecessors, was highly interested in the new political developments coming from Europe and was keen on changing the fortunes of his empire. However, before we head on to Europe, let's first look at the peoples of the Ottoman Empire so we can better understand the multi-ethnic state that lasted for over six centuries. By the end of the 18th century, the Ottoman Empire was home to 27 million people dozens of ethnicities, and dozens of religious denominations. The empire for centuries had controlled the destinies of many ethnic groups such as the Turks, Greeks, Kurds, Armenians, Arabs, Jews, Serbs, Albanians, Bosnaks, Bulgarians, Romanians, Romani, Tartars, Macedonians, Croats, Montenegrins, and many other ethnic groups. Since the creation of the state back in the late 13th century, the Ottoman Empire was a Sunni Islamic state that instituted religious Sharia law based on the Holy Quran and Kadith to its subjects as a way to enforce basic law. In contrast to early modern Europe, where widespread religious persecutions and wars over religion were common, the Ottoman stance on religion was more relaxed compared to its counterparts in Europe. Under Sharia law, the peoples of the book, Christians and Jews, were religiously tolerated and were given legal protections and autonomy to govern their own communities within the empire. 
the thousand-year-old institutions of the Eastern Orthodox Church were preserved by the Ottomans, and the Church enjoyed a period of peace under Ottoman rule after centuries of infighting with each other and Catholic Europe. During the 16th and 17th centuries, the Ottoman stance on the practice of religion was very attractive to many fleeing the religious wars of the European continent. The Muslims and Jews of Spain fled to the Ottoman Empire during the Spanish Inquisition of 1502. During the European Wars of Religion, the Ottoman Empire became a refuge for many Protestant denominations seeking safety from Catholic Europe, such as the Huguenots, Anglicans, Quakers, Jesuits, and Calvinists. While Jews in Europe were often persecuted and scapegoated by European states, Jewish communities in the Ottoman Empire flourished, with the coastal city of Thessalonica serving as the largest Sephardic Jewish city in Europe for over four centuries. The Pax Ottomanica, similar to the Pax Romana of the Roman Empire, provided relative social and economic stability to the many ethnic groups of the Ottoman Empire, in which the state facilitated a long-lasting peace in the regions it ruled. Compared to other periods in their history, certain regions of the Ottoman Empire experienced the Pax Ottomanica to a wider extent compared to others. Before Ottoman rule, the Balkans were plagued with countless wars and conflicts between the forces of the Latin Crusaders, Bulgarian Tsars, Serbian despots, and Byzantine emperors. To the east, Anatolia was filled with competing Turkish warlords all battling each other for the supremacy over the peninsula, and the Middle East was in a constant state of war between various competing Islamic sultanates vying power over the caliph. The Ottomans, during the course of 200 years, managed to unite all of these war-torn regions into a single political entity not seen since the days of the Roman Empire. However, there were major limits to the Pax Ottomanica. Under the Ottomans, non-Muslims on average paid more taxes to the state, they were forcefully recruited into the Def Shema system, and socially they were seen as second-class citizens, subservient to the Muslim class. By the time of Selim III, just being tolerated was not enough for the minority groups within the Ottoman Empire. The age of absolutism in Europe was starting to end by the late 18th century. The revolution in France transformed King Louis XVI from the King of France to the King of the French overnight. At first glance, this change does not seem too significant, but if we look closer into this change, we can see how revolutionary France threatened the very existence of many European monarchs by this action alone. Before the revolution, the kings of France were the rulers of the lands which were under French rule. Regardless of ethnicity, every person within the Kingdom of France was the subject to the French king, and all military and political authority came directly from the king himself. For centuries, many European monarchs claimed supreme autocratic power by divine right, which meant that their subjects had no right to limit their political powers since they were given a mandate by God to rule the state. This centralization of power could be seen during the reigns of many European monarchs such as Henry VIII of England, Charles I of England, Peter I of Russia, Louis XIV of France, and Frederick William I of Prussia. The French Revolution of 1789 had overnight made Louis XVI the king of the French and not France. No longer was he the king of the lands of France, but now he was the king of the French people, and thus became the protector of the French people and their new constitution, a task in which he would eventually fail at. The French Revolution of 1789 had introduced new concepts such as representative government, men as equals, people's right to self-determination, and nationalism to the European stage, a stage which was dominated by conservatives who wished to preserve the status quo in order to keep their power and political status in government. The French Revolution of 1789 
sought to overturn the conservative order of Europe in favor of an enlightened society based on the developments of the European Enlightenment. In France, representative government came in the form of a new French parliament made out of members from the many provinces of the nation. The concept of men as equals came in the form of a new French constitution which ensured the rights and freedoms of all French citizens within the country, rich or poor. The concept of the people's right to self-determination came in the form of national elections in which the French people could determine how the state ought to be governed by electing members to the national parliament. Lastly, nationalism came in the form of the belief that the state should resemble the populace it governs. But how can people from different social classes and backgrounds have a similar identity? Especially in a nation like France where wealth and inequality was rampant. In order to interconnect the peoples of France and create a sense of national unity, a common national identity had to be created for the nation by its revolutionary leaders. A common culture, ethnicity, geographic location, language, politics, religion, traditions, and most importantly, a common shared history were all created during the French Revolution for the French people. France looked back to its past to form a national identity in order to proclaim what was special about the French people. Overnight, the French people were now the heirs of the Celtic Gauls who pushed Julius Caesar to the limit during the Battle of Elysia. The Carolingians under Charlemagne the Great who conquered Western Europe and re-established the Roman Empire in the West. Medieval knights that fought alongside of Joan of Arc during the Siege of Orleans against the invading English. And now the French people were the heirs to Napoleon's new French Empire that spanned across Europe. During the Napoleonic Wars of the early 19th century, these new ideas would spread around the European continent, and when it did reach the Ottoman Empire, it would seal the fate of the multi-ethnic absolute monarchy. The ideas that came out of the French Revolution called for a homogeneous society, the polar opposite of the heterogeneous Ottoman Empire, which was home to dozens of ethnic groups and religions. During the course of the 19th and early 20th centuries, a cycle of violence between the Ottoman state and its ethnic minorities would erupt into various independence movements around the empire, which would result in large-scale atrocities conducted by both sides. Both the Ottomans and revolutionary groups would justify their actions by stating that they sought to preserve peace for their people. But in reality, they wished to establish their own peace over each other, thus undermining the other. In the Ottoman case, peace would come in the form of the non-Muslim class being subservient to the ruling Muslim class, and in the revolutionary case, peace would come in the form of a homogeneous nation free from Muslim influence and rule. The Pax Ottomanica that the Ottoman state provided for its people for centuries would fall apart during the last century of the empire's existence, which would see the bond between its various communities also fall out into open conflict. Ascending to the throne during the height of the wars with Austria and Russia, the 28-year-old Selim III inherited an Ottoman Empire that was starting to fall behind Europe militarily and socially. Fifteen years before the ascension of Selim III, the Ottoman Empire had concluded a previous war with Russia, which saw the loss of the Crimean Khanate to Empress Catherine the Great paving the way for the creation of the Russian Black Sea Fleet in 1783, thus endangering Ottoman supremacy in the Black Sea. Also for the first time in Ottoman history, a foreign power assumed direct responsibility for the fate of a wider religious community within the Ottoman Empire, thus undermining the national sovereignty of the Sublime Porte. The current wars that Selim III found himself during the spring of 1789 were the direct responses to Ottoman demands for Russia to relinquish the Crimean Khanate, which Russia had illegally annexed back in 1783. 
Not knowing it had overplayed its hands, the Ottomans declared war on Russia and quickly found itself in a two-front war with Austria, who had signed a secret alliance with Russia a couple years prior to the war. The majority of the war saw the Ottomans being routed by both Austrian and Russian forces in both theaters of the conflict. However, with events coming to a boiling point in revolutionary France, and the Russians and Austrians being bogged down in the Balkans, a peace treaty was signed between the two European powers and the Ottoman Empire in 1791 and 1792 respectively. Only a small strip of land in northern Ottoman Bosnia and the region of Yedisan in Ukraine were transferred to the victors which saw the Ottomans getting off lightly for a war it had started and performed very poorly in. Although the war ended in humiliation, it finally gave Selim III some breathing room to implement some of the much needed military and governmental reforms that the Ottoman state badly needed. For the last half century, a series of French officers were hired by the Ottoman state to reorganize and retrain certain military units within the Ottoman military. However, for the most part, these military missions were dealt with heavy opposition by three major social groups within the empire. The first group was the ulama, the Islamic scholar class of the empire, who disliked the notion that non-Muslims were training the soldiers of the Prophet Muhammad and were skeptical of growing European influences within the empire. The second group were the Janissaries, the elite military class of soldiers in Ottoman society, who were concerned about being replaced by another military class by recent military reforms enacted by the Ottoman state. The third and last group were the Ayans, the wealthy provincial magnate class of the empire, who were worried about the potential tax increases that the military reforms might entail, and attempts by the sublime port to centralize their semi-autonomous holdings around the empire. As soon as the wars to the north were over, Selim III started sending ambassadors to various European capitals to study and report on various administrative and military institutions of the West, in addition to learning Western languages and culture. At home, he would begin to invite French officers to submit appropriate reform proposals for the Ottoman army in order to combat Russia's ever-growing presence in the Black Sea. After years of foreign training and buying the latest European weaponry, a new regular army was established in 1797 out of ethnic Turks from Anatolia called the Nizam Jadid. In order to appease the Janissaries, who feared the Nizam Jadid would replace their ancient order, Selim III gave reinsurances that the new military unit was only an extension of the Bostanja order and that the new military unit would only serve in the Asian territories of the empire, far from the Janissary strongholds in the Balkans. Other reforms by Selim III came in the form of a new imperial treasury to pay for the new army, the creation of an official state printing house in Constantinople, the introduction of French academic materials into Ottoman military schools, reorganization of the Ottoman navy, the introduction of an official budgetary office, and a statewide operation to end nepotism and corruption. However, the year 1797 would also see a turning point in Ottoman-French relations. Ever since the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottoman Empire and France were natural allies as both nations were the rivals of Habsburg, Austria, and Spain. Throughout the centuries, the activity of the alliance fluctuated, but both nations overall maintained positive relations with each other as both France and the Ottomans wished to build their own spheres of influence on the opposite sides of the European continent. Even after the French Revolution and the execution of Louis XVI, Franco-Ottoman relations were maintained between the two nations. Even during the war of the First Coalition between France and the majority of Europe, Selim III postured a pro-French settlement by inviting French officers and ambassadors to Constantinople. However, the Treaty of Campo Formio of 1797 that ended the War of the First Coalition saw the newly established French Republic acquiring the Ionian Islands off the coast of Ottoman Albania and Greece, 
this would result in the Ottoman Empire and France being neighbors for the first time in history, which caused political drama to play out in the capitals of the two states, as Ottoman statesmen believed that France had just interfered in their own sphere of influence in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, while French statesmen denied having any ambitions in Ottoman territory. French military aggression in Europe had finally touched the gates of the Ottoman Empire, which now made Selim III explore new prospects for new alliances elsewhere. The year before the peace treaty saw Catherine the Great's death and the ascension of her passive-minded son, Tsar Paul I, who abandoned his mother's aggressive attitude against the Ottoman Empire. The new Russian Tsar wished to press for reapproachment with the Sublime Port in order to counter France's newly established influence in the Eastern Mediterranean by gaining access to the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits so that the Russian Black Sea Fleet could sail into the Mediterranean. By the end of 1797, Selim III started negotiations for a new alliance with Russia and Great Britain as his fears about France were starting to mount up. The fears of the Ottoman Sultan were well founded as Napoleon would invade Ottoman Egypt the following year. The dissolution of the Franco-Ottoman alliance left the Ottoman Empire politically isolated from Europe and during the course of the raging wars in Europe, the empire struggled to keep its neutrality and territorial integrity from both outside and inside forces. During the summer of 1798, Napoleon's military expedition in Egypt had beaten the local Mamluk nobility with ease during the battles of Shumrakit and the Pyramids, which resulted in the regional capital of Cairo falling to French forces only 24 days into Napoleon's campaign. Napoleon's efforts to persuade the local populace of Egypt to see the French armies as liberators and the Mamluks as oppressors failed miserably, which resulted in the French violently suppressing a revolt in Cairo in late 1798, killing more than 5,000 people in the process. After suppressing the revolt, Napoleon set his gaze towards the rich Ottoman trading cities of the Levant and thus started to march his armies up north towards Ottoman Palestine. By this time period, Great Britain had joined the conflict in Egypt on the side of the Ottomans in order to deter French presence in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. During the late summer of 1798, the British under Horatio Nelson had destroyed the main French navy off Egypt during the Battle of the Nile, leaving Napoleon and his forces in Egypt isolated from France. Two months after the Battle of the Nile, the situation for Napoleon would get even worse as a joint Russo-Ottoman military operation in the French-controlled Ionian Islands would end in victory for the two former rival empires thus leaving France's presence in the whole region in a precarious situation. Napoleon's single decision to invade Ottoman Egypt had ushered in a diplomatic revolution in which the Ottoman Empire found itself being allied to the very state that had beaten them in a major war only six years prior. By the spring of 1799, Ottoman reinforcements from the capital had arrived in Syria under the command of Jazar Pasha. Selim III's new military unit, the Nizam Jadid, also accompanied the Bosnian Pasha down south as Napoleon had started his offensive into the Levant. After the fall of Jaffa in early March and the slaughter of its citizens by the French, Napoleon next set his sights on the coastal town of Accra. Jazer Pasha and the Western trained Nizam Jadid made their debut against the French during the defense of Accra with the help of the British Navy off the coast. The siege of Accra would end in an Anglo-Ottoman victory which would result in Napoleon abandoning his entire campaign in the region and escaping back to France, leaving his army behind in Egypt. The successes of the Nizam Jadid during the battle against the French was a huge political victory for Selim III as he hushed his critics against his military reforms in the capital. 
By 1801, the last French presence in Egypt had surrendered, and the process of reoccupation of lost lands during the war was conducted by the Ottoman state. However, after the French withdrawal from Egypt, a power vacuum arose in the region, which would lead to new conflicts in Egypt in the future. The British had started to support the Mamluk factions in the region in the hopes of creating a pro-British alliance state in Egypt, while Ottoman land forces under Muhammad Ali Pasha and the naval forces of Kuchuk Hussein Pasha were trying to reintegrate Egypt back into the Ottoman Empire. Even though peace had been achieved in 1801, the decentralization of power in the Ottoman Empire had started to ramp up much to Selim's efforts from the previous decade. As Egypt's future status was up in the air, Wahhabism, a stricter interpretation of Islam, had begun spreading around in the Middle East, thus endangering Selim III's authority in the region as Caliph. Also, the newly formed nation of the United States of America had declared war against the Ottoman-aligned barbary states of North Africa, thus endangering Ottoman influence in the region. Meanwhile, in the Balkans, a series of magnate rulers had begun to carve up the region between themselves, thwarting the authority of the sublime port in the process. The renegade Ali Pasha had formed a semi-autonomous state in Ionia. Osman Panzvlola, a rebelling Ottoman general, had extended his power over western Bulgaria, southern Serbia, and Wallachia, and Tursinklola Ismail Pasha and his lieutenant Bayraktar Mustafa Pasha had occupied eastern Bulgaria for themselves. Lastly, a coup was conducted by the local janissaries of the province of Spintanova against the sublime port appointed governor of the region killing him in the process and taking over the province for themselves. The situation for Selim III became even more dire in 1801, as Tsar Paul I of Russia was killed in an assassination plot, thus also killing any future prospects of a Russo-Ottoman alliance against France. Thus, during the years between 1801 and 1806, saw the Ottomans starting to play the game of neutrality between the powers of Europe. In Ottoman Serbia, the renegade janissaries of the province after their coup started to oppress the local Serbian populace by revoking their newly obtained rights and privileges given to them by Selim III during the previous decade. Events took a bloody turn when, in 1804, the renegade janissaries executed 72 Serbian nobles in the region, thus sparking the first Serbian uprising the same year. The three-sided war between the renegade janissaries, the sublime port, and revolutionary Serbia engulfed the region of Smetanova ablaze. After the fall of the Janissary-controlled Belgrade in 1806 to the Serbians, the Muslim population of the city was massacred and the rest were baptized by the Serbian revolutionaries. Central Ottoman authority from the capital was disintegrating day by day in the Balkans. Meanwhile, in Ottoman Egypt, the Albanian mercenary forces tasked with reoccupying the region had risen up in revolt in 1803 under the leadership of Muhammad Ali, and now another three-sided war erupted, this time between the British-backed Mamluks, Muhammad Ali's Albanians, and the sublime ports Koja Husrev Pasha. However, the events from Egypt were far more decisive than the events from the Balkans. After a couple of years of fighting and the massacre of the Mamluk nobility in the region in 1807, Muhammad Ali Pasha had come out on top, thus effectively ruling Egypt by himself. The destabilization of the Ottoman Empire during the first years of the 19th century would create an atmosphere of unrest and uncertainty amongst the subjects of Selim III. Back in Europe, Napoleon's decisive victory at the Battle of Austerlitz against the Russians and Austrians ended the War of the Third Coalition in a French victory and ended Slim's attempts to stay neutral in the conflict. Seeing the military coalition against France being practically dead, Slim III decided on restoring ties with France. After Austerlitz, Selim would, for the first time, formally recognize Napoleon as the Emperor of France during the first months of 1806. However, as temporary peace spread across Europe, 
Tensions in Constantinople were at an all-time high. Back in 1805, Selim III issued the construction of a new Nizamajeda battalion in Edirne, thus breaking his promise with the Janissaries that the new military corps would only serve in the Asian provinces of the Empire and not in the Janissary heartland of the Balkans. A conspiracy formed by Tursinkla Ole Ismail Pasha, Grand Vizier Hafiz Ismail Pasha, and the conservative bloc in the capital formed in 1806 with the goal of preventing the expansion of Salem's new military corps into the Balkans. An incident during the summer of 1806 in Edirne between the Nizam and Jadid and the forces at the Balkan Ayans almost sparked a civil war. However, knowing that his forces were heavily outnumbered, Salem III decided to defuse the situation by abandoning his plans for expanding the Nizam Jadid corps into the Balkans thus inflicting a death blow to his political aspirations for reforming the empire's military. Meanwhile, in Europe, Selim III's friendly attitudes towards France started to make Great Britain and Russia suspicious of the Sultan's foreign policies, thus both nations demanded the cessation of French influence within the Ottoman Empire. However, after the French victory at the Battle of Jena against the Prussians in late 1806 during the War of the Fourth Coalition, Selim put all of his eggs into one basket by blocking Russia's access through the Straits, thus openly siding with Napoleon in the process. Selim III would then follow up this action with installing pro-Ottoman princes to the head of the Romanian principalities, deposing the pro-Russian princes that were installed a couple years prior. Russia under Tsar Alexander I responded by invading the Romanian principalities in late 1806, in which Selim III responded by declaring war on Russia. At the same time, Great Britain would follow suit and declare war on the Ottomans after negotiations to remove French ambassador to Constantinople, Horace Sebastiani, from the Sultan's court had failed. By the end of the year, and now desperate Selim III started to openly ask for an alliance with France, thus officially breaking Ottoman neutrality in the Napoleonic War so far. Selim III's popularity at home also took a nosedive after the Edirne incident back in 1806. The Janissaries and the Ulama were always displeased with the Sultan's military reforms, but now some of the members of the reform faction in government start to see how the reforms have plunged the Ottoman state into an economic crisis. By 1807, Selim's Nizamajetic corps, which numbered around 25,000 active men, were beginning to strain the resources of the state. The sublime port over the years had debased its own currency to keep up with the Sultan's demands, which resulted in large-scale inflation throughout the empire. Along with Selim's foreign policy decision to back France and declare war on Russia, many started to resent the Sultan for his actions abroad and domestically. Tensions in the capital finally blew up in late May of 1807 when the Janissaries rose up in revolt against Selim III. Selim, as a way to defuse the situation and show a sign of good faith, ordered the Nizamajedid back to their barracks and began negotiations with the rebel leaders. This gave the conservative factions in the capital time to group up their forces in the city by stalling negotiations with the Sultan. On May 27, thousands of Janissaries, Ulama members, religious students, and others who opposed the Sultan marched on the Imperial Palace. And now desperate Selim III tried to appease the violent mob by disbanding the Nizamajetic corps, but this action would prove a little too late for the Ottoman Sultan. The rebels start to refuse going into negotiations with Selim. With few options left on the table, Selim III resigned as Sultan two days later in favor of his cousin Mustafa, the conservative candidate to the throne, and proceeded to live in a house arrest in the Ottoman cafes. The newly crowned Mustafa IV would become a puppet ruler to the conservative faction that placed him on the throne. In a short period of time, the Nizamajedits were disbanded and all of Selim III's other governmental reforms were reversed.
The former Sultan of the Ottomans was now openly vilified for his reforms that destroyed the Ottoman social order, violated Islamic law and tradition, and lastly for leaving behind an empire that was on the brink of falling apart. The old military Janissary clans got their former privileges back and all former members of the Nizam Jadid were now hunted around the empire and a reign of terror followed against who in any way had supported Selim III's reforms in the past. However, almost immediately after Selim's abdication, the conservative faction in Constantinople started to fracture as conservative Grand Vizier Hafiz Ismail Pasha was killed by the Janissaries during the anarchy that pursued after Selim's downfall in the capital. Meanwhile, out in the Balkans, Tirstinka Ole Ismail Pasha's successor, Bayraktar Mustafa Pasha, started to gather the former supporters of Selim III by forming a center of opposition to the new regime in Ottoman Bulgaria in an attempt to become Grand Vizier. Back in Europe, Napoleon's victory against Russia during the Battle of Friedland had ended the War of the Fourth Coalition. The resulting treaty of Tilsit saw the French agreeing to abandon its alliance with the Ottomans in order for the Russian Tsar to mediate a peace between France and Great Britain. Napoleon also agreed that if the negotiations with the British failed, he would join the Russian war against the Ottomans and make arrangements to divide the Sultan's dominions with his new ally in Russia. In return for all of this, Russia was to recognize all of France's conquests in Europe and agree to give back the Ionian Islands to France. The Treaty of Tilsit was a major French political victory secured by sacrificing the Ottomans to the Russian Tsar. In the eyes of the French, the Russians had now been kept out of the Balkans and the Straits, and France had now achieved full control in the Adriatic, regardless of what might happen in the British negotiations that would follow. Selim III's risky gamble of abandoning Great Britain and allying with France back in 1806 became a disaster for the new conservative government in Constantinople. The Ottomans were once again diplomatically isolated from Europe. Back in the Balkans, Bayraktar Mustafa Pasha's opposition stronghold in Bulgaria was seen as the only force that could re-establish law and order in the capital by many of Selim's former supporters. Bayraktar Mustafa Pasha was hardly a strong supporter of Selim III's reforms at first, but instead a strong advocate for autonomy for the Ayans against whoever was in power in Constantinople. He and his predecessor, Tunsikla Ole Ismail Pasha, had joined the other Ayans of the Balkans during the Indirna incident against Selim III, but now it was the conservatives who ruled Constantinople, and who, once in power, disliked the influence of the Ayans as much as Selim III. By 1808, Bayraktar Mustafa Pasha and his supporters were ready to march on Constantinople, eliminate the conservative faction, and restore Selim III back to the Ottoman throne. During the summer of the same year, Bayraktar and his forces stormed into the capital, killing the rebel leaders and other Janissaries who supported the conservative faction. However, before Bayraktar could take control of the imperial palace, Mustafa IV had ordered the deaths of Selim III and his stepbrother Shahzada Mahmud in order to secure the Ottoman throne for himself as the last surviving male member of the House of Osman. Selim would be shortly killed in his apartment after a bloody struggle with his killers, thus ending the life of the 46-year-old former Sultan who reigned over the Ottoman Empire over 18 years. However, Shahzada Mahmud was luckier as he avoided Mustafa's agents and successfully crawled up a chimney to the roof of the Imperial Palace in the middle of the night. The following morning, when Bayraktar's forces stormed and occupied the imperial palace, Shahzada Mahmud would be hailed as Sultan, thus ending Mustafa IV's chances of retaining the Ottoman throne for himself. Mahmud II would start out his reign under the domination of the man who brought him into power, Bayraktar Mustafa Pasha, who he appointed as the new Grand Vizier, the first provincial ayan to ever hold the office. 
Now that he was in power, Bayraktar started to take on the interests of the Sublime Port, abandoning his Ayan ways of looking into politics in order to save the Empire from fracturing. His first move as Grand Vizier saw him exile the conservatives from the capital and install men willing to accept his new leadership and reforms. The 23-year-old Mahmoud II also shared the aspirations of his late step-cousin Selim III in reforming the state, so the new Sultan and his new Grand Vizier made plans on reviving Selim's reforms. During his first months in office, Bayraktar would invite the Ayans around the empire in order to form a unified Ottoman front in the face of European aggression against the Ottoman state. A charter of alliance was signed between the Ayans and the Sultan, thus establishing central authority in the empire once again. After these positive developments, Mahmud II and Bayraktar Musifa Pasha started to revive the Nizamijedid course under the new name of the Sekbanijedid. Before the closure of the year, the Sekbanijedid were rebuilt to 10,000 men with another 150,000 envisioned to join during the next few years. However, the speedy reforms of Mahmud II and his Grand Vizier started to spook the Janissaries, who once again started to question the Sultan's intentions regarding their ancient military class. Both Mahmud II and Bayrak Dai were inexperienced rulers and they would fail to see the rising resentment of the Janissaries and Ottoman citizens of the capital to their domestic policies. For one, the residents of the capital started to heavily loathe the way Bayraktar and his men conducted themselves in an arrogant fashion in public and how his administration had started confiscating private wealth for themselves. Tensions would blow up only three months into Mahmud's reign. During the holiest day of Islam, at the breaking of the fast on the last day of Ramadan, the Sekhbani Jedid made their public debut for all to see. Outraged by the open flaunting of a rival military corps, the Janissaries rose up in open revolt. False news that Bayraktar Mustafa Pasha was going to disband the Janissary order was also spreading around the capital, which only ignited the Janissary cause even more. Constantinople was set ablaze once again, and during the following morning, the Janissaries would storm the sublime port and kill Bayraktar Mustafa Pasha and his men, then proceed to besiege the Imperial Palace in order to depose Mahmud II and install the imprisoned Mustafa IV. At the same time, Ottoman naval ships from the Bosphorus loyal to Mahmud began bombarding the barracks of the Janissaries, which killed thousands of innocent civilians in the process. In the chaos, Mahmud II ordered the death of his stepbrother, the former Sultan Mustafa IV, in order to secure the Ottoman throne for himself as the last surviving male member of the House of Osman. The former Mustafa IV would be strangled to death in his apartment soon after. After getting the news of the former Sultan's death, the ulama had convinced the Janissaries to stand down and negotiate with Mahmud II as he was now the sole male member of the imperial dynasty that was alive. In the following negotiations, Mahmud would then disband the Sekhbanijedid course, which resulted in a general massacre of its ranks by the Janissaries. Mahmud II's first chance of reforming the Ottoman military ended in absolute failure, but unlike his late cousin, he managed to keep his throne intact from the rebels. While Constantinople was ripping itself apart, the Ottoman Empire was still in a state of war with Russia, Great Britain, and the Serbians. After the events of late 1808, the Ottoman state could finally focus on foreign threats and begin to act accordingly for the first time since the deposition of Selim III back in 1807. After being repelled by the forces of Muhammad Ali in Egypt during the Fraser expedition, Great Britain sued for peace with the Sublime Port in early 1809 as they were now at war with France and Russia on mainland Europe thus abandoning their plans on a pro-British Mamluk state in Egypt. Meanwhile, in Serbia, the Serbian revolutionaries formed their own independent state in 1809, after years of routing multiple Ottoman armies from the region. The Serbian proclamation of 1809, which proclaimed an independent Serbian state in the Balkans, also called for national unity of the Serbian peoples by establishing a common Serbian history and culture, separate from the Ottomans. <laughs>
In response to the proclamation, an Ottoman army under the command of Husrit Pasha was sent to Serbia to regain control of the region for the Sublime Port. During the summer of 1809, the Ottomans would purely defeat the Serbians during the Battle of Sigar, thus defeating all hopes of an independent Serbia. This time, it would be the Ottoman army under Husrit Pasha who would commit atrocities. As a way to get payback for the massacre of the Muslims of Belgrade back in 1806, the surviving Serbians from the battle would be gathered up by the Ottomans and were beheaded, and their skulls were used to make a massive skull tower near the Serbian city of Nish. The years between 1809 and 1812 would see the Ottomans slowly crush the Serbian revolutionaries back to Belgrade, while they themselves were being pushed by Russia in Georgia and Dobruja. After six years of war and expecting Napoleon's invasion of their country, Russia would enter negotiations with the Ottoman Empire, which was also militarily exhausted after years of war. The Treaty of Bucharest would end hostilities between the countries in 1812, which would see the Ottomans ceding half of Moldavia to Russia, thus giving the Tsar access to the vital region of the Lower Danube Delta. The following year would see the Serbian revolt being crushed by the Ottomans, which saw dozens of Serbian villages being set ablaze and thousands of Serbians being sold into slavery. With the Napoleonic Wars winding down in Europe, the Ottoman Empire was able to establish relative peace for the time being under Mahmud II for the first time in over a decade. However, the events of the last decade should have been a sign of things to come for the Ottomans, as in the following years, events domestically and internationally would boil over into revolution.